Brittany. I just wanted to welcome you to this breakout session, Sex Workers Being Impacted Servicing. And I'm here to introduce today's moderator, Sophia Gretzkin, who directs the program on global health and human rights at the USC Institute for Global Health and holds appointments as Professor of Preventative Medicine at the Keck School of Medicine and Professor of Law and Preventative Medicine at the Bloom School of Law. So please, everyone, welcome Sophia Gretzkin. And to be moderating this kind of amazing panel of women. Um, and I'm also really excited because it's the first panel I think I've ever moderated where there's no PowerPoint. <laughs> so that's not <laughs> a very good thing. All right, so congratulations everybody on, on that. Um, so a couple of things just by way of introduction. Um, sex trafficking, by definition of uh, the U.S. Trafficking and Violence Protection Act, refers to the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision for obtaining of a, per of a person for the purpose of a commercial sex act. And the reduction of prostitution to sex trafficking has really split trafficking advocates, with some arguing that uh, curb demand campaigns hurt sex workers and others taking the opposite position. And so in this panel, what we hope to do is explore that discussion and also in the conversation with all of you. Um, the ground rules for this are fairly simple. Uh, we'll be going down the row starting with Norma Jean, and each person will be given eight minutes to speak. At three minutes, they're going to get a little card warning them that it's three minutes, um, so that we can make sure that we hold to time. And then what we'll do is take a round of questions and a round of comments from people, then go down the panel, and then once again do the same thing. So just so that everybody has a sense of kind of how we're hoping to spend the next two hours. You have everybody's bios um, in the packets, and I encourage you to read everybody's bios. What I'm just going to do is just quickly give just a two-word two introduction to each person. Um, our first speaker is Norma Jean Amanovar, who is the director and founder of the International Sex Worker Foundation for Alt Culture and Education. Uh, our second speaker will be Kay Buck, who is the CEO for the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking. Um, our third speaker is Kimberly Bond, who will be the professor of sociology from Boston College. Our next speaker, everybody I think knows at this point, uh, she's the composer, playwright, musician, and PhD candidate from Annenberg, who was responsible for that play last night that everybody's talking about. And um, our last speaker over here is Clary Lerum. How do you kind of pronounce your last name? Lerum. Who's an associate professor uh, for the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences at the University of Washington? So, will you join me in welcoming this excellent panel? <laughs> and, Norma Jean, we'll start with you. All right, great. Okay, well, <clears throat> I'm going to talk really fast because I have a lot to say in a very short time. So, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, I spent 10 years with the Los Angeles Police Department as a civilian traffic officer before I left and became a call girl, which was a career step up majorly. And the reason that I did this is because I had something to say about what I saw as horrendous police corruption and abuse relating to sex workers, prostitutions, particularly street workers. Um, I was 21 years old. I was very idealistic, and I joined the LAPD because at five foot four, I wasn't going to be a police officer for a while because they didn't hire women as police officers yet. By the time I was 31, I was so disillusioned and disappointed, and I was really, really angry at society because of the abuses that the police committed in the name of protecting people for their own good. And I said, somebody's got to know about this. So I left the LAPD, uh, <clears throat> and I became a call girl. My sole goal at that time was just to expose police corruption. I had no idea that sex work would turn out to be such a good job for me. It was. It was the best job I ever had. But that's a whole other story. And um, so I wrote a book. I went to prison for writing it. Um, anybody who wants to see me on 60 Minutes, one of the, get one of my bookmarks uh, after the thing, and you can go on my website and see me on 60 Minutes where I was incarcerated for writing my book about police corruption. And one of the things that really, I have been an activist now for uh, 31 years. I left in 1982, so next month, 31 years. And, um, it's cost me a lot of things, including my health, uh, including any money that I ever had and ever made in sex work. Uh, cops made sure that I lost it all to lawyers. 
my husband and I, and yes, I'm married, and I've been with my husband for 37 years. Can you imagine a whore being married? Oh, my God. <laughs> but um, <laughs> nevertheless, we've been together for a long time, and we just lost everything when I came home from prison, and my husband is now disabled, and I take care of him. But in the meantime, I still work on this because this is the most important issue to me. And one of the things I find problematic with the anti-trafficking uh, coalition that doesn't understand the unintended consequences of these laws which conflate prostitution with sex trafficking is that you don't understand, you do not want to put vulnerable people in the hands of cops who cannot keep their hands off of children or adults and they rape us with impunity and I'll get to that in a minute but I want to go, this goes back hundreds and hundreds of years, including when um, Shakespeare wrote his play, King Lear, I'd like to read you the <coughs> two quotes from Act 4, Scene 6, page 7. King Lear is talking to Gloucester. He says, Thou rascal beetle, hold thy bloody hand. Why dost thou lash that whore? Strip thine own back. Thou hotly lusteth to use her in the kind for which thou whippest her. Translation, you stupid cop, stop your violence. Why are you whipping that whore? You should be whipping yourself since you're the one that lusts after her and yearn to, yearn to do the same thing for which you're punishing her. And that is unfortunately what happens with these laws. I mean, people talk about it, increasing the tools that you give to law enforcement. And I say, please, do not give them any more tools. They have plenty of tools. They just don't know how to fucking use, excuse me, I use language like I did when I was on the LAPD. I swear like a cop. I'm sorry, it's just a bad habit I never got over. All right, so here's what we have. And one of the reasons why people don't understand that the police use these laws to extort us for sex, money, and information. If you cooperate with a nice police officer, you can continue practicing your trade for as long as you want, provided you provide him with a blowjob periodically, and or money, and or become an informant. But this is what happens when they actually get caught raping us, and they do this frequently. First of all, the judge who used to be a cop, you'll see all my boards over there, I, I suggest that afterwards you go and read some of those because they will just make you so angry you can't see straight. Um, judge Gilbert C. Alston, who was a former LABD cop before he went to college and got a degree and became a judge, said prostitutes cannot be raped. That's what he said. And apparently there's a lot of judges who agree with him. This came from 2008. Thomas John Sadler, a San Diego Sheriff's deputy, <coughs> was finally charged after assaulting prostitutes all the way back to 2001. He was finally charged with raping or attempted to rape a prostitute. He um, tried to get her legs apart and was grabbing her and for some reason he couldn't have an erection. So it didn't count as a full rape. This is what he said to her. Bitch, I can do anything I fucking want. But he tells the judge, I'm a man. I saw a prostitute. I wanted to have sex. And that's what he told uh, Judge uh, Michael Smith. And so the judge sentenced him to two years in prison. He did not have to register as a sex offender. And the judge said, the crime was offensive, but not worthy of the upper prison term of three years. Yet, Prop 35 just passed, wants to incarcerate our nonviolent, non-abusive clients, employers, and associates for 20 years and give us a lifetime sex offender registry. Now, back when I was arrested, I was charged with one count of pandering, which should now qualify as human trafficking, because I tried to get my big, fat, ugly friend, Penny Laid. It was her idea. She was on the police department. She wanted, you know, she said she, it was her fantasy. I found a client. I paid the client to see her. And because I said these words, she said, is there money involved? I said, yes. What do I have to do? I said, nothing you haven't done in a normal adult relationship. That constitutes the felony crime of pandering, for which I spent seven years in legal hell. 50 days in solitary confinement, being studied to see if I was dangerous to society. Then on two years and seven months on probation, but violation-free probation, the district attorney appealed my sentence on the ground that my crime was worse than rape or robbery because I was commercially exploiting my law enforcement past to draw on scandalous escapades that undermine respect for the law. 
And so two years and seven months later, the appellate court overturned my probation sentence and I went off to prison with the Manson family. I was resentenced to three years. Now, that was horrendous. People were angry. 60 Minutes did an interview with me. And those are the kinds of laws that are now qualifying someone like me to be incarcerated for 20 years because the police can use these laws to extort us for sexual favors. And I know that my time is up. I know that a lot of times people equate prostitution with rape. I want to give you a statistic. This is from the um, statistical overview from the US government. It was published last December, this past month. And this is something for you students to think about. <clears throat> if you are concerned about prostitutes being raped, in 2006, an estimated 673,000 of nearly 6 million women attending colleges were raped in one year. And you're worried about us? That's all I've got to say. I mean, I've got so much to say about cops and about cops having sex with children. Uh, like in the 2010 uh, National Mis Police Misconduct Report, which says in 2010, 249 cops had sex with minors. And yet, the prosecutors of the states that want to outlaw Backpage from putting ads on said, we had 50, 50 men in, in 22 states over three years. Well, you had 249 cops in one year that diddled kids. What are we going to do about that? Thank you. here in town in Los Angeles called the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking, or CAST. Mm -hmm. And we were one of the first organizations to organize uh, to provide direct services to survivors of human trafficking or modern day slavery. And also, um, th those experiences that we had in working directly with survivors were ones that informed all of our policy measures, all of our policy initiatives. And so we worked, the founders of CAST worked on the uh, first law uh, in the country called the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, or TVPA. You've probably heard a lot about that earlier today. So um, I have a lot to talk about as well, uh, but I want to start by just saying that curbing demand or the end demand campaigns that uh, we hear a lot about over the last five to ten years uh, is relatively new if you look at the broad global movement against human trafficking and modern day slavery. And, you know, what we do at CAST is operate uh, based on an empowerment model. That's everything from our direct services with survivors uh, to our policy initiatives. In fact, we work with survivors as partners to uh, actually uh, gauge our legislative agenda each and every year. And so one thing I want to, uh, I want you all to have as a takeaway from today is that, you know, we should think of demand a lot more broadly. So we shouldn't just focus on the demand uh, that fuels sex trafficking or exploitation, but also the demand that fuels uh, labor trafficking and exploitation. Uh, locally, about 50 to 60 percent of our cases are forced labor cases. And of that, most of them are domestic servitude cases that happen in very affluent areas mm -hmm. uh, of this city. And so it just really brings a perspective that when we talk about prevention, it has to be in the broader context, a, context, a, a more holistic approach to ending modern day slavery. And you know, as a direct service provider, uh, we really see firsthand, and it kind of goes to your point, Norma, about policies compartmentalizing sex and labor trafficking cases. All that does is really fragment uh, the movement. And I mean, in any social movement, in order to be strong, you have to be united. So we see this when we're serving survivors of sex trafficking and survivors of labor trafficking. When end demands um, come, at, come about, 
it actually fragments the work of survivors. I, I cannot believe that any of us in this room would want to see that happen. We want the sisters and brothers uh, of the movement to make sure that they're working together. So uh, that's one thing I really wanted to um, point out. There's also the issue of prosecution and criminal penalties, um, which are usually the focus of prevention in modern day slavery. And you know, I wanna say that uh, in working with law enforcement, uh, there was one law enforcement officer that really made an impact on me actually, because she said that, I don't understand why law enforcement uh, is so, such a, a big issue for the modern day slavery movement. Really, we have very little to do given that there are so few investigations and prosecutions of this crime. Why not take a victim-centered approach, which is what we do at CAST and a lot of organizations uh, across the country do this as well and, and really all over the world. But it, it really speaks to how we have to be survivor-centered and not uh, criminal justice or, or prosecution-centered because the reality is that such a tiny slice of the pie of a survivor's life. You wanna look at you know, what happens in their, in their life and their continuum of, of healing from this human rights violation. Um, so this brings me to the importance of an empowerment approach. You know, NGOs or non-governmental organizations or service providers working directly with uh, survivors need to provide a wide range of, um, of services that are aimed at empowerment, not rescue. The way we look at services is that people come to us with resilience and strength that I can't even fathom. You know, they survived modern day slavery. They are survivors. And empowerment is not so much something that we give to them, but that we help you know, create an empowering environment. They already have the empowerment. They have the resilience and the strength. What we do is support them on that journey after they leave a slavery situation. So um, I also want to point out uh, one more thing around uh, policies and, and really practices that happen. As an NGO in the anti-trafficking movement, um, government policies such as the anti-prostitution pledge, and I don't know if you all learned about that earlier today, but there's a pledge that um, NGOs have to sign on to. And, you know, basically it states that you won't, um, you know, promote legalization of prosti prostitution. You won't, I mean, if it's interpreted uh, technically, it, it could even be said that you wouldn't actually support a survivor who's actually working in the sex industry. Now, can you imagine if you compare that to the issue of domestic violence? Mm -hmm. We know more about that issue where if, you know, I think now the stat is a, a, a battered woman will go back to her, her batterer eight times on average. Mm -hmm. And so if we didn't help her, what would happen? If we closed our doors and, says you, and said you're not allowed to come back because you're returning to that type of abuse, what good is that? So. It's really important for service providers and NGOs working directly with survivors to have a non-judgmental, uh, non-condemning approach when working with survivors. It, it's key. Um, and unfortunately, um, this anti-prostitution pledge makes it very difficult for mm -hmm. those of us working in the field to even have a discourse like this. To be honest with you, I was hesitant to speak today because I receive federal funding as an organization. And even though this pledge is not often um, enforced under this particular administration, it still exists. And it's difficult for those of us who have truly the most experience working on this issue um, and working with survivors that we can actually be open, come to the table with an open heart and open mind to have a discussion about what will really work. And so what we have are a lot of new organizations who are, believe me, well-intentioned, community groups and volunteer groups, sometimes even faith-based groups, working on this issue from a rescue standpoint. And they are closely associated with the Curb Demand campaigns. And what we see here locally is that they will stake out brothels, they will um, <coughs> you know, chart activities of John's visiting brothels. 
And what they don't realize is that's actually doing more harm than good. It's actually harming the people inside the brothel. It's putting their community volunteers in dangerous situations as well. Um, and so I, I just, the, the takeaway I want everyone to have today, and I hope you have more questions for me, is that honestly, this is such a, a multifaceted issue and such a complex issue, surely, the opportunities to do something about it are endless, and it doesn't have to be staking out brothels and, and rescuing people uh, from <coughs> brothels. You can become more responsible consumers looking at uh, slavery issues and forced labor issues in supply chains. You can uh, fundraise for your local NGO that shelters survivors of human trafficking. Um, you can raise awareness uh, in your community. There's a lot of things that people can do to actually uh, work on prevention. And um, it doesn't always have to be such a large focus on, on curb or end demand campaigns. Thank you very much. Is this on? Can you hear me? Hi, so I'm Kimberly Hong, and I, um, I'm just gonna go briefly over my research methods so that you have a sense of what I was doing. I, I'm taking this conversation actually to a more international level and looking at um, the state of sort of sex trafficking, and I say this in quotes, in Vietnam, where I conducted 22 months of ethnographic research in Ho Chi Minh City sex industry in two phases, uh, 2006 and 2007, and then again in 2009 and 2010. During that time, I worked as a hostess for 15 months um, in four different niche markets that cater to both global and local men. And the talk that I'm focusing on, and, and I conducted 263 interviews with sex workers, clients, and madams and bar owners who are part of this transnational circuit as this in, through this in-depth ethnography. The talk that I'm doing today focuses mostly on 71 sex workers and 50 clients in a niche market that caters to Western men. I'm working on a book project that um, looks at four different niche markets that cater to wealthy local Vietnamese men and Asian businessmen, overseas Vietnamese men who return in the diaspora, Western businessmen and Western budget travelers. And the two lowest paying niche markets, and I can get into this later, are the ones that cater to Western men that are embedded within transnational circuits. And so I just want to get into the talk, um, which I prepared because I have eight minutes. So there are these images of women in handcuffs and chains that circulate through print, television, and online, on, online news outlets that perpetuate this view of women as traffic victims of third world poverty who are kidnapped, forced, and sold into sex work. Governments, corporations, religious organizations, celebrities do devote millions of dollars to save trafficked women. But few conduct systematic research on the ground to assess this problem. In fact, I just had a conversation with Mark Taylor about how the US State Department has had a difficult time doing this in Vietnam. And so the work that I do is, and the purpose of getting in and doing the ethnography is to conduct this kind of systematic research to raise two primary questions that I'm addressing in the talk. The first question is, how do sex workers capitalize and in this empowerment language on global economic restructuring to improve their lives and the lives of their families? And what I'm really talking about in my book is how, is how sex workers are shrewd entrepreneurs engaged in sexual commerce. They're not traffic victims. And the second question is, okay, we think about men as monolithic sort of perpetuators of violence. Um, and the question is, well, how do men actually respond? Nobody looks at male clients. You know, very few people interview them and conduct systematic research on these clients. So when I began the preliminary research in 2006, I went to Vietnam as a feminist at the age of 22, many years ago, looking to save sex victims of sex trafficking myself. But I was shocked when I found that few of the women I met had been duped or sold into the sex industry. Many workers migrated from Ho Chi Minh City's villages to work in factories or service sector work prior to entering into sex work. So naively, I approached some of the women in the factories. Um, in these I ended up in this clothing factory run by a local NGO. And I approached them and I asked them, sort of was trying to get a, a sense of what their lives were like and what was going on. And, a few of them wanted to talk, and after a long moment of awkward silence, I Yi, a 19-year-old sex worker, says to me, I used to work in a factory making $70 a month. I did that for many years, but I wasn't making enough money to send to my family. So I quit and went to work on the streets. One day, I got caught and was sent to this center. She's talking about a rehabilitation center. 
And this woman said that I could get out early if I, if I went to go work with this, N with this organization, which was an NGO that would teach her how to sew clothes. I agreed so that I could get out of the center. I'm here now doing the same thing that I was trying to escape. They say they want to help us, but they're only helping themselves. I get paid 30 million BND, which is the equivalent of $200 a month to work here, but I know that they sell these clothes for a lot more money abroad. And sure enough, they are marked as fair trade mm -hmm. products, artisan products sent from Vietnam to the United States and Europe. So through that conversation with Ai Nhi and several others, I came to realize that many of the women working in that shop were not victims of sex trafficking, but they were bold hustlers who stepped out of factory work and domestic work into, into sex work to carve out a better life for themselves. When garment companies engage in corporate philanthropy to save trafficked victims, they essentially force women back into the exploitive working conditions that they were trying to leave. And you know, a lot of corporations, Nike and this, on their girls project, and, and they have a factory in Vietnam, in, these corporations indirectly benefit from engaging in philanthropic support to save women and children, because those same women and children end up back, work, end up back in the factories working for the subcontractors who produce their goods. And so the one thing I wanted to say, to go back to the narrative that I brought at the beginning of these images of women in handcuffs and chains, these, quote, saved women are fully aware of their circumstances. And they also regarded with irony the, vic the images of victimization publicized by NGOs. For example, Tui, a 25-year-old sex worker in the shop, says to me, everyone comes here and looks at these pamphlets, so these pamphlets that NGOs circulate. A photo with photos of women crying or happily sewing clothes. That's how this organization gets money from people to pay for this place. People feel sorry for us because they think that we're forced to sell our bodies and that and they want to help us. It's so backwards because we're probably sleeping with their, she's referring to their donors, their husbands, and they don't even know it. <coughs> the women who, who cater to Western men also engage in a variety of practices to make their bodies desirable to their male clients and to appeal to their these clients' um, imaginations of their victimhood. Swan, a 19-year-old sex worker, said, a lot of men here think that Vietnam is still a poor country. They want to hear that your family is poor and that you have no option, so you come here to work. If you make them feel sorry for you as a poor Vietnamese village girl, they'll give you a lot more money. We lie to them because it works. We tell them that Vietnam is changing and growing so fast that the price of food and gas has gone up and people from poor rural areas can't afford to live off the rice fields anymore. V, a 22-year-old worker, says, Western men in America hear about girls who are forced or sold to sell their bodies, but no one here is forced to do anything. I come into the bar if I want to work, and I have sex if I want to have sex, and I don't if I don't. No one forces me to do anything I don't want to do. People come here trying to give us condoms or trying to save us, but how can they help us when we make more money than them? They're talking about local um, women who are local NGO workers that are paid local salaries to distribute condoms. And, and to give you a picture of the client side of this story, several of the clients, and you know, many of these men are portrayed as these you know, sexual predators. And, I, and, and in interviewing them, I became actually very sympathetic to their plight because they expressed a desire to visit villages where they could walk through rice fields, ride bicycles, and bargain for produce in the markets. So the women organized tours to visit fake families in the villages and portray an authentic Vietnam removed from signs of global change, modernization, and capitalism. And so during one of the visits to the village, um, at, uh, upon the return visit, I was talking to a client named John, and he says to me, there are so many things that we take for, take for granted in the West, roof over our heads, hot water, shoes. When I was with Nhi, I had to shower with buckets of cold water. It was so disgusting because I was brushing my teeth and I didn't realize the bucket had a bunch of maggots in there. And those were planted there. So that the women could then ask for more money to build a shower or a faucet or whatnot. And in this way, the women are shrewd entrepreneurs who are engaged in particular performances that highlight their poverty to elicit empathy and sympathy from their clients. Who And these men genuinely do have concern um, and do send large amounts of remittances back to Vietnam. So I just want to conclude by saying that while President George W. Bush and Barack Obama both agreed that the U.S. should commit resources to save women from the horrors of sexual labor internationally, none of the women I met described themselves as kidnapped, forced, or duped into the sex industry. Rather, they made conscious choices to sell sex because they saw factory work and service work as more exploitive forms of labor. So beyond the images of barbed wire hand and handcuffs, are actual men and women engaged in complex relationships. 
As governments and activists intervene in these women's lives, aid efforts must move beyond the sex industry into other locations, such as factory work or domestic work, to address the multiple and interconnected sources of, of exploitation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I just first wanted to thank those of you who came to uh, the musical last night. It's really great to see what such a wonderful turnout. Um, and so for those of you who came, this will be a little bit of a review um, uh, from the sort of academic standpoint. And for those who didn't, um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about uh, the research that informed the writing of Survive and also um, that informs my dissertation work. And specifically, I'm going to focus on um, a policy in Thailand called Smart Raids. Um, well, I'll back up. My, my, my comments today are informed by um, research that I've conducted in Thailand over the past two and a half years. Um, I've been going there about twice a year, and I've uh, conducted qualitative interviews with NGO employees and government officials, sex workers, female migrant laborers, particularly from Burma, um, and collected data primarily up in Chiang Mai and Chiang Rai and also in Bangkok. And I wanted to, or I want to, continue to understand the discrepancies between anti-trafficking policy in Thailand and women's experiences of this policy on the ground. Um, and this question uh, and project responds to a problem identified by scholars of feminist international relations, um, which is that often in international research, uh, the voices of the people, and particularly women, are the ones that are most overlooked. So it's a, it's a, it's a research, um, it's researching how research is done. Uh, that's part of my project. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about anti-trafficking policy in Thailand to give you some context. Um, over the past couple of years, Thailand's become come under criticism for its failure to comply with the recommendations outlined in the U.S. Department of State's um, annual TIP report, which ranks all the countries of the world um, according to a, a, a tier system set forth by the 2000 Protocol. Um, the, the TIP report has cited problems with Thailand's inability to comply with the minimum standards of anti-trafficking policies and has mandated that, in Tha that Thailand increase its efforts to prosecute cases and penalize traffickers. Um, and it has concluded by downgrading Thailand to tier two watch list status, which as you probably know is the second to lowest rung um, in, in the uh, rung on the ladder of the TIP report. So the response to this has been an increase in the funding of something called smart raids. Um, smart raids are essentially when, and in, in Thailand's context, when NGOs in cooperation or collaboration with the Thai government um, raid a brothel or a karaoke bar or any place where they suspect <coughs> there might be underage prostitution uh, occurring. And what happens during these raids, um, my sources have told me, is that all the women in the brothel or the establishment are rounded up they're taken to the IDC, the International Detention Center, one of several in Thailand. And then a weeding out process occurs um, in which um, social workers and government officials try to identify victims from the non-victims. And it, according to the TIP report the, of the State Department, <coughs> smart raids are grounded in real evidence, have a well-defined goal that's grounded in law, and are planned to ensure the safety of everyone involved. And they should ideally also include arrangements to segregate supervisors, conduct victim-centered interviews, cross-reference victims' accounts, and quickly transition to post-rescue care and shelter for identified vi victims. Um, and the State Department uh, sort of prides itself in the TIP report by differentiating these raids from what they call blind sweeps, which are where no evidence um, is presented about um, the presence of a trafficking victim. The intelligence about around smart raids, however, is predicated on there being an underage prostitute in one of these establishments. And underage prostitutes, um, as you probably know, are automatically considered um, trafficking victims. So while the policy, so the policy is intended to help victims of trafficking. However, the problem with sm smart raids is that it actually hurts, hurts women who do sex work consensually, <coughs> whether or not they're above uh, the age of 18. Secondarily, the, the problem with smart raids is that it's actually being used as a, a tactic, uh, I argue, to suppress immigration uh, in Thailand, as many of the women who um, are caught in these brothel raids are migrants from Burma or from other countries surrounding Thailand, and Thailand has a very um, strident anti-immigrant policy. So 
This creates a double bind for the women who are caught in these raids. Um, it's troubling for several reasons. They're troubling for several reasons. Consensual prostitutes, um, the sex workers who are consenting to, to, to their work, um, lose wages and time, and they're re-stigmatized under, under these conditions. And even more troubling, underage uh, sex workers are often held indefinitely without tr proper translators or, and without due process. And I've heard multiple um, stories of, of these huge experiences of, of women in Thailand. So it's in, a, in essence, smart raids violate the rights of both groups, right? Even though they're, 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 uh, they're intended to help victims of trafficking. And I also argue that they create a binary categorization that strips women of agency. Since prostitutes are criminalized and illegal immigrants are criminalized, the women, in, the women targeted by this policy are put into a category as either being a victim or a criminal. Mm -hmm. So prostitutes over 18 are illicit actors, they're dehumanized and objectified, while those under 18 become victims who end up being equally voiceless, <coughs> powerless, and unable to act or think for themselves. Well, the reality is that often these women are merely trying to work to feed their families. Um, and as my interviews dem demonstrated, those who, many of those who've migrated into Thailand um, are responding to very difficult conditions in the surrounding countries, particularly in Burma, um, with ethnic minorities at war with the militarized junta. Uh, material and filial obligations create the necessity for them to earn money. And these migratory journeys are often connected by necessity to sex work. Um, I'm going to skip down because I don't have a lot of time. I, I guess uh, what I want to jump to is that the problem with, the problem with smart raids is that they're informed by the anti-prostitution framework of the U.S. government. And um, I suggest that we need to not only just look at this policy, but we really need to examine the underlying moralisms that inform these policies and the continued, uh, the continued implementation, even under the Obama administration, as several of my colleagues have, have pointed out. Um, you know, it's, it's staggering to me that in Thailand, many, multiple NGOs and officials who I talked to you know, when I press them on this and say, well, hasn't the anti-prostitution pledge, isn't that le legislative, isn't, aren't we done with that? Mm -hmm. You know, that was overturned, or that's, things are back to normal, and they, they don't even necessarily know, or they don't even necessarily um, agree. Mm -hmm. So, um, I have a lot to say about how a feminist approach could, uh, could reimagine uh, anti-trafficking policy, but I don't think I have time for that. So I will conclude by just suggesting that a, a more nuanced look at anti-trafficking policy is needed. Um, you know, <coughs> anti-trafficking policy, it seems that, that the goals of the, t of the State Department are to create one broad um, brush that will cover everything so that they can reach everyone. But that's really a problem, painting one policy brush over all women's experiences. Um, flattens their experiences, according to Rosal Brenius in her book, um, and uh, really takes away the nuances um, and the positions of different women in different situations. And I just argue that in order to really address this problem, we need to look at those nuances, those discrepancies, um, and those very nuanced different experiences of women's lives. everyone. Um, I'm just uh, so honored and thrilled to be here today. Um, when I first heard about this conference happening, I was just, I couldn't contain my excitement. And then when I was invited to be a speaker, I was even more thrilled. Um, I just want to say just before I start that it's, it is uh, also an honor to be on the panel with Norma Jean. Um, I was uh, at your conference. Uh, Norma Jean uh, uh, created a conference uh, not far from here in Van Nuys, California in 1997, the International Conference on Prostitution. Mm -hmm. And at that point, nobody was talking about trafficking. Mm -hmm. This before, this just completely has changed since then. Um, so thinking about this, the difference in discourses and um, criminalization versus victim, I mean, we were really in the criminalization zone at that point. So just, I just think it's t wanted to take a moment just to recognize that we've come a long way and yet we are still in a very kind of problematic space. So 
Um, in the short time that I have today, I want to talk to you um, about bigger picture issues. Um, I'm a sociologist as well as a cultural studies scholar, and I want to think about and talk with you about what I'm thinking about uh, the stories that we tell about human trafficking and um, thinking about what are some of the historical and maybe even ancient mythical principles that are informing these stories that we're telling. Um, <clears throat> With the, uh, well, the causes of human tra global human trafficking are complex and the motivations for political mobilization against human trafficking vary widely. The most best known story about human trafficking in the United States and exploited, exploited globally is one told as a sexual morality tale filled with clear victims and vic vi villains and victims. Stories about lost sexual innocence, girls and young women tricked or abducted and sold into prostitution by foreign or evil, evil men are often told by celebrities, filmmakers, select researchers, often whose methods, findings, and estimates have not been subjected to scholarly review. We've heard a lot of critiques about the bad data. Um, and yet, those stories are the ones that are elevated. Those are the ones that are seen as the ultimate truth of, of human trafficking. But despite this, the story's tenuous, if best, uh, empirical basis, US-based anti-trafficking efforts um, anti-trafficking campaigns focusing on, on prostitution as stolen sexual innocence and as sexual slavery have been met with enormous success in the United States. What accounts for this triumph in selling what I would call a radical anti-prostitution sentiment to a broad sector of the United States? How did this shift happen in the midst of a rising sex worker rights movement and increasing tolerance of sexual commerce across various cultural realms? The answer, I contend, lies at least in part in the successful ideological fusion of 20th century feminist and, human and humanitarian principles, 19th century slave abolitionist discourse, and the resurrection of the Garden of Eden trope. <coughs> That's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Um, so before addressing this question of talking about the Garden of Eden, um, I uh, want to first note again that it's important to note that until the early 2000s, virtually no one in the United States talked about prostitution or sex work in terms of sex trafficking or sexual slavery. For many sex workers and their allies, including myself, outside of high-level conversations in the United Nations and the U.S. State Department, we heard some of those early stories in the early uh, plenary this morning. For many of us, those new labels seem to come out of the blue. Out of the blue. These terms are indeed the latest of many reframings of the problem of prostitution, including late 19th century, sorry, late 20th century framings of sex workers as sick. Um, however, unlike what I what I call the 12-step feminist framings of prostitutes within late 20th century U.S. institutions, the anti-trafficking movement has catapulted anti-prostitution sentiment to new depths of influence on local, federal, and global arenas. Many social and legal scholars have discussed and critiqued the socio-political landscapes of contemporary anti-trafficking campaigns, which in the United States are particularly ca characterized by alliances between radical and second wave feminists with, with contemporary Christian evangelicals. Um, it's con char characterized by 19th century slave abolitionist discourses. It's always also been characterized by many neo-colonialist themes um, that have been critiqued and anti-immigration sentiment. Um, a number of scholars have also remarked critically on the ways that this has been feeding into criminal justice uh, focuses rather than social justice focuses, feeding into a neoliberal and mass incarceration trend that we're seeing that's been a, a, increasingly documented in, in the United States, and about how criminal men abducting innocent women create stories for mainstream media con uh, consumption. I know I don't have a lot of time here, so I'm going to focus on, this, on the function of stories um, in building this, this case, this radical anti-prostitution case in the United States specifically. Um, these existing scholarly explanations underscore many of the social processes, but what is it that ties these divergent social groups and agendas together? In her fieldwork and interviews with radical feminists and conservative evangel evangelical Christians, uh, sociologist Elizabeth Bernstein notes that while radical and feminists and conservative Christians are very different in many ways, what is united, what unites them is a moral absolutist belief that sexuality should be expressed outside of the con should be expressed within the confines of loving relationships rather than for recreational or commodified purposes. So I think that's important to note that that's one key connection that she has noted 
I want to build on her observation here by suggesting that in order to create a popular moral uprising uh, against a growing cultural sexual ethic that included recreational and commodified themes, then deeper cultural triggers needed to be pulled. Okay, um, and so to, ski to, to just uh, cut to the chase here, what are those deeper cultural triggers? How many of you know the Garden of Eden um, story? I'm sort of assuming that many of you, but not necessarily all of you do. So the basis of it is that uh, Adam and Eve, the first Evans, were, uh, the first uh, humans, were told by God to uh, avoid picking a fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Eve decides to do that, uh, eats it, and then and tempts Adam to do so as well. As a result, um, she got a bunch of gendered punishments from God, including <laughs> painful childbirth, a directive to be faithful, and to have exclusive desire for her husband and subordination to her husband. Um, how does this story relate to anti-trafficking stories? Uh, it doesn't necessarily make sense and automatically. I think that it, that it makes sense in a number of ways with one key twist that uh, in the Garden of Eve, Eden myth, uh, Eve was seen as uh, the sinner and she was condemned. In the anti-trafficking movement, Eve is now seen as the victim who's been um, abducted through the serpent. Um, so there's, there's, I'm working through some of this logic here, but this is where I'm going here with this. And so um, bear with me um, in, in just giving you just three quick examples. So I'm thinking about this new story, there, this new cultural story as um, having this feature of redeeming Eve. So Eve is the, the sex worker victim um, through victimhood. Um, one, of the things that, one of the things that we know as cultural studies, uh, that we know it, it gets into kind of a mythical realm, is when you start hearing the same story over and over and over again. And this is something that we hear in uh, a lot of sex trafficking victim stories. Elizabeth Bernstein, again, uh, has noted that nearly identical narratives were presented at multiple anti-trafficking conferences that she attended throughout the course of her field work. Uh, field work. The only significant alteration was the, the, the victim's name. So that's, to me, that's kind of highlighting that something else deeper and culturally is happening. Um, so in order to work with this Garden of Eden myth too, that the story of Eve, has, she has to not uh, have free choice. She has to be, uh, in order to be seen as a victim, she, uh, there needs to be a couple of things that happen. One, um, her, her agency needs to be taken away so that she didn't choose that evil thing, that evil temptation. So being abducted is a great way to, to say, well, you didn't choose to do that. The other way that's, that's very um, uh, helpful is to only focus on minors. In this country, if you're a minor, then you have the, legally cannot have consent, therefore you cannot have agency. Secondly, just quickly, um, what happens to Adam in the story? I think that Adam is in a precarious situation in that he can no longer blame Eve for his sin. Um, and so he has, to, he has to do a bunch of work. And so I, I'm thinking about uh, a splitting of the atoms. So there's the good atom and the bad atom. And that's where the end of the man um, campaign comes in. So the end of the man campaign makes Adam decide uh, you can be a good man or a bad man. And if you're a good man, then we're going to reward you. Nicholas Kristoff is a good Adam. Uh, Adam, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, Ashton Kutcher is a good Adam. You know, he had that campaign, uh, real men don't buy girls. And he, he presented many good men uh, to show that this is what we do, and this is where we make this choice to be good men, and we do not buy girls. We do not succumb to that temptation. Okay, so the third part, I think, is actually the most important. I know I'm completely out of time, but I just wanted to make sure I hit home with it, is incarcerating the serpent. What happens to the serpent? This is where the... the in, the very endemic uh, incarcerate, mass incarceration system is coming into play. Um, I just want to briefly read to you um, a uh, news release from the FBI. I'm on the FBI. Um, I get all sorts of news from them just because I'm curious what they're up to. Um, I don't know if you heard recently, but there was a couple of days ago uh, a great success uh, called Operation Dark Knight. Did you hear about this? Um, so our Operation Dark Knight uh, into a sex trafficking ring operating in Florida, Georgia, and Carolinas. Um, the investigation was led by ICE's Homeland Security Investigation, Homeland Investi Security Investigations, led to uh, a, take, a takedown yesterday in which authorities made three, uh, 13 criminal arrests and 44 administrative arrests. 
Um, what I want to get to is some of the metaphors here, again, to think about the story that's being told. Here's a quote from the director of ICE, John Morton. ICE investigates a wide array of crimes, but the trafficking of women and girls for prostitution is among the most sinister. Few crimes so damage their victims and undermine their basic indecency. Our fight against this evil must be relentless both here and abroad. So this is a quote just from a couple of days ago from the director of ICE. He, by the way, was a keynote address, keynote speaker to another anti-trafficking conference of a different theme that happened two days ago at Georgetown University. So this is, this is kind of the, the land, the cultural landscape that I'm trying to make sense of and think about this, not just in terms of the legalities, in terms of, you know, there's so many different dimensions, but just thinking about the level of the stories that we tell. And I just would like to end um, with a plea or, I guess, uh, an invitation for new myths and new stories and, and new ways of thinking about this. And, and, and I think that artists and filmmakers uh, and cultural workers need to be a part of this movement. I think that I'm absolutely in agreement with the folks from the earlier session that we need more data, we need more good data, we actually need people who listen to data and understand how to evaluate data, absolutely but we also need more cultural stories about this that come from a different perspective. Thank you. Thank you. I think you'll all agree with me. That was an excellent set of presentations. Um, really, I mean, honestly, it was great. And I was just, I was thinking as, as I was there, I mean, we, the, the, the activist voices that you all have, the academic voices, the practitioner voice, the policy voice, the storytelling, I mean, I was thinking, no, oh, it's all there. Like, it's, it's, it's there. It's, um, I have a set of questions, but I think I want to hold back because I think that everybody's been sitting for a while and that it would be nice if we let the room speak a little bit. So um, I want to open it up and I just want to ask if people have some questions and comments and what I'd like to do is to take, great, is to take, so, is to just have to take a round and then what I'm going to ask the panelists to do is that you listen to the questions and then I'll go down the row and then we'll take another, I got you, and then we'll do another, and then we'll do another row and, and like that so that everybody gets a chance to kind of speak because we have a good hour. So it would be nice to be able to have some time together, please. Yeah. And could, and could, and when, could you introduce yourself before you ask your question? Yeah, uh, my name is Victor Vallejo. I'm the city planner for the city of Los Angeles. Uh, my question is directed towards all of you and it does relate sort of to story documentary. Uh, maybe about a year or two ago, there was a documentary on television for a half hour, hour, I forget exactly, about human trafficking in the San Fernando Valley with young teenage girls. Who wants to address that? Um, and because that makes more money for them, it's a more lucrative business for them. Um, and I'm just wondering, you've kind of critiqued um, NGOs and that they're giving women jobs and they're in factories. What would be a better solution for that? Uh, since we've got questions from that first table, why don't we go down and then just take responses? Okay. Um, as far as young children, one of the things that I have over there at, on the table is a some research that I just did, uh, 30 years worth of FBI statistics on the uh, male, female, and all of by age, under age eight, uh, under age 10, all the way up to 65, and we're finding that absolutely the number of children that are being arrested is far less than the adults. So yes, there are children in prostitution. Um, and we're not saying they're not, it's just that we know that most of the ones that are being arrested are 17 years old, and while, yes, technically they're children in California and other states, they're not. I mean, one of the things I just don't understand, 
Um, if you all know who the actor Doug Hutchins is, he married a singer, Courtney Stodden, and she was 16, he's 51. They're married, they go on The View, they talk about their sex life. If he wasn't married to her, he would be in jail for statutory rape. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand why we have these problems with you know, sexuality and it's, it's okay. I mean, I saw that when I was on the police department. I knew a number of cops, there was one cop, Michael Casados, he was, he was having sex with 10 year old girls he did not get arrested, he did not go to jail. He got caught the first time, he was suspended for a while, then they caught him again, and that time he got fired. So um, my concern is, is we look at child prostitutes, but the majority of sexual exploitation of children, it, the 90%, according to the government, are people law, um, in law enforcement, uh, Boy Scout leaders, teachers, priests, uh, preachers, you name it. 90% of those who victimize children are not finding their victims through back page or paying for them or anything else. And those are the people we really need to worry about. Yeah, I, I don't know this specific documentary, but I mean, there's tons of documentaries and films about human trafficking. Um, speaking to your point that the landscape really has changed a great deal over the last five to 10 years and I mean, a, a funny story, when I, I was doing my work in Thailand, working with NGOs um, on human trafficking issues, and when I moved to the United States in 2003, um, I wanted to continue my work, and I called a local government agency and said, can you put me through to the department that works on trafficking? And they put me through to transportation. <laughs> so they did not know what human trafficking was in 2003. So it just speaks to that point that we have come a long way, but we have a long way to go. And I do think um, the point I want to focus on is that you know there are certainly cases that we have handled. So I know firsthand that sex trafficking of minors is real. That said, the majority of our cases are indeed uh, either sex trafficking of adult survivors or forced labor cases. What is not helpful, I think, to the movement is that there, people get carried away with um, what they perceive victims to look like, the innocence, the, you know, um, someone who need, is helpless, needs to be rescued. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have uh, policies and practices to help uh, survivors, you know, uh, children who are uh, enslaved in a brothel or a massage parlor or trafficked on back page, because those cases have really happened. But let's not focus only on that. The media does tend to sensationalize this particular issue. And what it does is it misinforms all of us. It misinforms the public so that when a domestic servitude case is happening next door in your own neighborhood, you don't see it because you're not thinking about <coughs> it in that framework. You're only thinking about it through the framework of uh, sex trafficking or sex slavery. So that's why, you know, the reason I decided to come today is to, you know, say we really need to take that holistic um, approach in looking at this. So there's forced labor cases, there's sex labor cases, but let's not confuse the issue of prostitution and sex trafficking. Since there's other people, I'll be very brief. Um, I, in terms of the role of NGOs, I, I, and I just will bring this back to the global, even though I know you raised this question in the US, one of the problems is that donors do not hold NGOs accountable for what they're doing. And so oftentimes you have this huge discrepancy between what donors are saying they're doing to what organizations are saying they're doing to get donor money and what they're actually doing on the ground. And it, that doesn't always mean that, dis, that the discrepancy is a bad thing because a lot of organizations are involved with women's and girls' empowerment of young girls and they're doing other things and they need to sort of pull on the heartstrings of donors to get money to stay funded. The problem with it is that a lot of times these organizations have trouble identifying trafficked victims. And ultimately, what they do is they end up increasing the criminalization of prostitution in order to keep, keep their donor funding up, right? So 
what happens is then women get, you know, you increase campaigns to prosecute and criminalize prostitution, so you get women that, are get, that get sent to rehabilitation centers and then get pushed back into organizations that are doing the same kind of exploitive labor that corporations are doing. And I think the question that you ask is, well, what would be a better, a better location? And I think what I'm doing in the book project is really illustrating how these women are shrewd entrepreneurs. And so there's an entire informal economy that work that operates around the sex industry and what I call sexual commerce in Vietnam. For example, there are tailors, beauticians, you know, um, manicurists, all of these different people, people that sell food and magazines because when I was working as a hostess in the bars, you're working 12 hours a day, seven days a week. So you literally live there. And there are a whole host of services that are brought to you in the back of the bar, you know? And, and so a lot of the women who can save enough money will open up their own business and start, and, and in many ways are very shrewd entrepreneurs. And to think of them as empowered women, as, as they've said, who can capitalize on these kinds of networks and relationships and expand their opportunities is really important. And I think corporate philanthropy covers all of this up. And the reason why or companies like Nike and now Google, Microsoft, all, you know, all of these people are so invested in this is because it allows them to elide a lot of the kind of exploitive working conditions that women are working in in those factories abroad. Foxconn is a perfect example of this. And so if we really want to get at the root of this, we have to think about labor exploitations that the women were escaping in the first place. Um. Yeah, please, okay. Uh, I just want to respond very briefly.